go to the book of 1 Kings chapter 22. You know, I, I haven't uh, <laughs> preached on a Sunday in a, mo a month. It was last year sometime that I last preached. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, that's because we got so many good preachers here. I mean, any one of these guys, I mean, any church would be so blessed to have them. And we're so blessed to have them. So I thank God for that. But I, you know, I've been preparing. God always makes me prepare a message, and I always do. And I take my preparation seriously. But then sometimes you just wake up and you get something totally different. And this morning, I just got very strong, this story in the Old Testament and the lessons that we can derive from that. So I pray for the help of the Holy Spirit, all right? 1 Kings 22. What a story that matches our times. They continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. By the way, that king of Israel's name is Ahab, okay? And the king of Israel said to his servant, Do you know that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as you are. My people is thy people. My horses are like your horses. Okay, so let me get, tell the story. Okay, we went through this in uh, Wednesday nights, all of First and Second Kings. My favorite Bible study I've ever done before in my life. What a fantastic collection of truth that God has blessed us with, all right? Anyway, so King Ahab is a very evil man. A lot of people know that. Most Christians know it. Ahab and what's his wife's name? Jezebel. So Ahab and Jezebel, very, very famous couple. She was a high priestess of Baal. And he just completely abandoned any faith he ever had and went and married her and, went and, and, and let her basically lead the country religiously. Think of that. The country, Israel, the only country on earth that had a true religion, was turned over to a priestess of Baal and the obscene pagan worship that goes along with that. Now this, the, ki the kingdom had split. So there was one part that still kept, kept the true religion. That was called Judah. And that king was named Jehoshaphat, which I love Jehoshaphat. I love that name too, by the way, Jehoshaphat. The me meaning is God shall judge. Okay. Now Jehoshaphat was a good king, but he had a weakness. And here's what his weakness was. He was ecumenical. Let me explain what that means because it's very relevant today. See, the kingdom of Israel was split in two. That's a long story, but Solomon basically led right to that. Ten tribes and two tribes. So the only place on earth that had the only true religion on earth is just divided into ten and two. And the ten were, totally went pagan, backslid, so gone. All that's left is two. And they had the temple. And Jehoshaphat was the king of the faithful part. But like so many people, and it is so natural, and it almost looks good sometimes, why can't we be together? Why can't we have unity? We're all Israel. We are Israel. Why can't we get the tribes back together in unity? It always sounds good. It sounds great. I don't like to fight. I don't want to fight. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Why can't we all be in unity? Well, the answer to that is because of truth. You cannot be in unity with people that deny your religion. Let's face it. I mean, if you want to, you can, but it's going to be, it never ends up good. But this guy always wanted to get them back together. And he's a tender-hearted guy. He had a good heart. And he wanted this ecumenism, all right? So he comes down, and when the king Ahab says, will you go with me to fight one of my wars? Uh, he said something very pervertedly similar to what uh, Ruth's, Ruth said to her mother-in-law. Remember one of the most beautiful passages in the book of Ruth. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. 
Ruth converted to the true religion and told her mother-in-law, I'll never leave you or forsake you, okay? But this is a perverted uh, uh, expression of that. This is a good king, a godly king, but he's ecumenical and he's so weak against what we would call the world that he basically gave a perverted confession. My armies are your armies, my people are your armies, your battles are my battles. That is the first lesson we can learn. And the lesson goes like this. Do not be unequally yoked together. Nothing good will ever come of that. It's going to destroy you. This is a, see these stories in the Old Testament, it's really a shame that preachers don't preach the Old Testament anymore. These are warnings. That's what Paul said. All the Old Testament is a warning upon, uh, for us upon whom the end of the time has come. We are at the end of time. These are warnings. These are, this is why it's so sad. One famous preacher has a son that started a mega church. Andy Stanley is his name. He said, you know what? We need to get rid of the Old Testament. Too much war. Too much battle. Too, too much judgmentalism here. Just unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That is the devil talking. It all sounds good, though. So anyway, he's, he gives this perverted confession. But then he, <laughs> this is the second lesson we can learn. Do not disregard what you hear, in a sense, in your conscience. Because as they're getting ready for battle, all of a sudden he says, you know what? Let's pray about this. <laughs> okay, let's pray about it. He already made the commitment, but let's pray about it. So Jehoshaphat said, verse 5, to the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord. Let's, let's find out what God has to say. Now, that's a great idea. And by the way, that's going to become more and more utterly essential all the way to the end. We have a God who will speak. He does speak. He doesn't leave us in the dark. Our God is alive. They're, you know, the Bible says their gods are idols. They're dumb. They can't speak. They, they can't see. They can't walk. And they become like them. Okay, so you worship an idol, you'll be deaf, dumb, and lame, right? But we got a God who speaks. Amen. So Jehoshaphat gives some good wisdom here. Let's pray and see if God has anything to say to us about that. Do you have any prophets here? Now, here's where this story gets really interesting. King Ahab said, prophets, we could, we're loaded with them. We got 400 of them. So they called a prophecy conference. I like prophecy. In fact, I'm a great student of Bible prophecy. I one time talked to a teenage kid that was raised, born and raised in a church. It was a, actually a Pentecostal church. I, I'm Pentecostal. And I said, you know, uh, do you know much about prophecy? Oh, yeah, we have people come to our church all the time, and they go up and give you a word, and they give this one a word, and they give that one a word. And that's his concept of prophecy. And look, there is a New Testament gift of prophecy. But I was sad about that because that kid didn't really know what I was talking about. There's so many prophecies in the Bible that are actually coming to pass daily right before our eyes. There's never been a better time to be into that kind of prophecy than now. This is why I marvel. I mean, so few will touch it. But then there's the other kind of prophecy, a prophecy conference, okay? So they have a prophecy conference. The king of Israel, verse 6, gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead? to battle, or should I not? So he's asking, should I do this or shouldn't I? What's God say? Shall I do it and shall I not? And they said, go up right away, go. The Lord is gonna deliver it into the hand of the king. So they, oh, they just got a word from God. Do it, go do it. And 400 of them, I mean, they, they go on to describe this prof prophecy conference, and it's amazing. They don't only just give the words, they act them out. They put on these brass horns, and they say, you're going to go to the enemy. You're going to trample the enemy. And I mean, it's just so, such a colorful, awesome, inspiring thing. And it's one after another, after another, after another. Don't go do this. Go do this. Go do this. Go do this. And, but there's something nagging. Now, this is another important lesson from this study. There's something nagging 
Jehoshaphat, even after the prophecy conference. And you know what it was? Oh, that's all fine and good. But it doesn't seem true. Let me tell you something. The heart knows truth when it hears it. Even if it doesn't like it. 200 years ago, an atheist, a famous atheist in England, David Hume, is running down the street at 5.30 in the morning. And one of his other atheist friends saw him and said, where are you going, Hume? He said, I'm going to hear John Wesley preach. And he scoffed, well, what are you doing at church? You don't believe that stuff? And Hume says, I know I don't, but he does. <laughs> Something awesome about that, right? He does. So, King Jehoshaphat says, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but do you have any real prophets in this kingdom? Is there anyone real? I mean, think about that. And guess what? This is really crazy. King Ahab, the unbeliever, absolutely knew what he's talking about and who he was talking about. So he comes back with, yes, there is one person that's a real prophet, but I hate that guy. Why? Because he never gives me a good word. See, this is the way some people approach it. Okay, uh, I don't like that place. It's, it's, they don't give me a good word. I don't like that church. They don't give me a good word. Oh, uh, oh, there, there's one. Oh, my goodness. I feel better about myself every time I go. That's a great church. They're always giving me a good word. And that's some people's approach to the whole word of God and to spirituality. And it's powerfully uh, deceiving because it feels good. But there is something nagging that king. And there's something obviously bugging Ahab. Because you sit there and hear all these false prophets. Blah, 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 blah. You'll win, you'll win. You're, you're great, you're great. You're wonderful, you're wonderful. Whole world revolves around you, whole world. And finally you get sick of it. You're through. And King Jehoshaphat goes, man. Seriously, do you know anyone real? Now, to me, this is an amazing thing because the bad king knew right away. Yeah, <laughs> we got one. Man, is he a problem. The king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, verse 8, Well, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. He really does live close to God, and he will really give us the word. But my problem with him is he never gives me a good word. I hate him, he says. He doesn't prophesy good concerning me, but evil. But by the way, here's another lesson. How do you know what good is or evil? What, what, how do you judge good and evil? Who knows what good and evil is? Maybe one of the worst things that ever happened to you might have been the best thing that could ever happen to you. Maybe this one promotion or something that you achieved or accomplished that you thought was like the center of your life might be your undoing. Who knows what good and evil is? Only God. Only God. Like Job's wife says, you know, Job, <laughs> quit serving God. I've looked at what's happened to us. It's not good. Well, what does she know about good? You know what I'm saying? Eve says... You know, I know what he said about that fruit, but it looks good to me, right? So that's another lesson out of this. What is good? What is evil? And who can really tell you? In order to be able to get through the minefield ahead, we have to attain a characteristic, we'll talk about it later, called the love of the truth. It's like if you go to the doctor and, and, and you've got a swelling on the side of your face and he says, you know what? Uh, that is just a sign of good health because I see that red rosy cheek and don't worry about those spots breaking out on your arm and your back and your tongue. You're fine. 
Well, I hope you would have the good sense of King Jehoshaphat and say, well, you know what, something wrong with this. I don't want to be told what I want to hear. Well, I do, but I don't, okay? I'd love to, but I don't. I need the truth. I need someone to level with me. And God will tell us the truth if we sincerely ask him. God will give us the truth. So anyway, this, this story gets more and more involved, okay? So follow with me here. He, he says, uh, I hate him. He doesn't give me anything good but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, don't let this king say so. Don't say so. Just bring him. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, hasten here Micah, the son of Imlah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before him. It's a prophecy conference. And they get more colorful. They're trying to outdo each other. And the one says, Zedekiah, whose name means the Lord is righteous. So, oh, great. He's got a good name. The Lord is righteous. God have listened to what he has to say. And Zedekiah, the son of uh, Chaniah, said, made him horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, with these shall you push the Syrians until you've consumed them. So they're getting creative and they make these little props and everything like that. I just recently saw, and this is the craziest thing I've ever seen, is uh, a backslidden Pentecostal church inspired by the movie the lord of the rings so the elders and the leaders one one girl in the church gets a word we're to take a staff just like what is the gizmo no gandalf and this covid spreading too fast so they get in front of the church and they pound the staff down like the movie and says you will not come any further and everyone cheered look the thing is i'm not trying to put anyone down this is a warning to all of us. What does the Bible say about the heart? It's deceitful. You can't trust yourself. It's desperately wicked. That's why we thank the Lord. He gave us something outside of ourselves to measure by. The word. See, if I was, if I was making a wall for uh, my wife's greenhouse with my grandchildren, and the wall was totally crooked according to the level, what would you think of me if I bent the level until it made it right? <laughs> you can't bend the level. You can bend, but the level can't bend. Now look, this is going to become increasingly important because there's a terrible delusion coming to the earth. Now let's follow this story further, okay? So... He says, I hate him. The verse uh, 9, then, okay, they bring Micah. And, but on the way, all the prophets, 12, prophesied so, saying, go up, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. The Lord is going to deliver it into the king's hand. Oh, man, one, one word after another word after another word. But look at, see, because one of the things about the Bible that's so powerful, all of it, but especially in places like this, it shows human psychology. It lays it bare. What are we really like? So even the bad king gets bored of this. It's just fake. It doesn't taste right. It doesn't smell right. So anyway, verse 13, the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spoke unto him. So on the way in, the messenger says, Behold now the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. You better let your word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them and speak that which is good. Now, how relevant is that? How about the big tech people just cutting out anything that doesn't agree with the narrative? Now, we don't like it for other reasons because it's insulting, it's stupid, it's not true, it's a lie. But from a biblical perspective, it's setting people up for a huge deception. Because all they get to hear is their version. All they get to hear is their side. And most people will not object to that. Because they won't even know it after a while. There's not everyone remembers the wild and woolly days of the internet where everything, every voice was heard 
And as a consequence, by the way, conservatism went right through the roof. So anyway, so you better make sure he gets a good word. And Micaiah said in 14, as the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that's what I'm going to say. Now, that, now this is where it even gets more interesting. So he came to the king and the king said to him, Micah, should we go up against Ramoth Gilead to battle or should we forbear? A flat out straight up question. Should we do it or should we not? Are we going to win or lose? And he answered, go and prosper. <laughs> the true prophet says, go. Go to the battle and fight it and prosper. You'll win. I assure you, you'll win. For the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. <laughs> See how I told you it was going to get different. It's going to get weird. You're, uh, you read the story, you're expecting him to say something different than all the other prophets. But he says the same thing they're saying. And the king said to him, this is Ahab. How many times shall I adjure you? that you tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord. Now think about this. Even the rotten king who long ago had turned his back on God is begging the one prophet that he hates, please just tell me. I just want to know. Tell me. See? The heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? He wants to know the truth, and he knows that that wasn't the truth. Micah did not tell him the truth. Now, this is another one of the lessons that we can learn. Your heart knows truth when it hears it, and it knows lies when it hears it. But if you don't watch out, you'll just push on ahead, past that point, to follow the lie. Unless you have an inward commitment to love the truth no matter what. See, I didn't like it at first when I read the Bible and it said there's none righteous, no, not one. Because I actually thought of myself as a pretty good person other than a few picadillos on the side. All right. But I had to accept it. See. And then there was a time where I was actually following false prophets, Kenneth Copeland and people like that many years ago. And then one day God showed me what they were really all about. And then I had a choice to make. Am I going to follow these people further in the name of loyalty, in the name of my friends or my group or my people? Or am I going to follow the truth? I had to renounce all that stuff. Why? Truth is the most important thing. With all you're getting, get understanding, the Bible says. Seek the truth. The truth can make you free, but the lie will bind you. So here's the moment of truth for the two kings. They're standing there. A true prophet comes up and says, yep, go ahead. Do it. Just go to battle, and you will win. God will give you the victory, just like all the false prophets. And the, even the bad king says, no, come on, I beg you. That's what it means, I adjure you. I'm begging you. Just once. Tell me what the Lord's really saying. Tell me what the Lord's really saying. And then he gets one of the most unique revelations in the whole Bible. Verse 17. And he, the prophet, says, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills as sheep that do not have a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master let them return every man to his house in peace. Oh, there's the truth. There's the real vision. What's he telling Ahab? Not only will you lose the battle, but you're going to die. They're going to be scattered. That's what I saw. Now someone says, well, how does that explain him lying? Why did he lie? Why did he lie and tell the same thing the other false prophets were saying? Why did he stand there in the name of God before two kings and tell them, go ahead and go to battle? When he knew, the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you he'd never prophesy any good concerning me but evil? <laughs> okay, now, this is a very interesting thing, too, about human psychology. 
just for that sliver of time. Ahab got real, just for a second. Please tell me, I adjure you, tell me, tell me. And he got the truth. He got the truth. But then he goes back and turns to King Jehoshaphat and says, see what I mean? This guy's a terrible prophet. Never gives me a good word. He's awful. And then he says, here comes the behind the scenes. One of the most unique revelations in the Bible given to one of the worst people in the Bible. Verse 19, he said, hear therefore the word of the Lord. Here he goes. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. Wow. And all the hosts of heaven were standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Now when he says all, he means all. What's all mean? The fallen and the unfallen. All the angels in conference with the Most High. It does happen. Job tells you about it. All the angels assembled. Bad ones and good ones. Devil walks in says, and the Lord says, where you been? This is another one of those. I saw them all. All the good angels, all the bad angels. And then the Lord made a proposal. The Lord said, who will persuade Ahab so he could go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? You understand what he's saying? Look, I want to wipe out Ahab. I want to judge him. I want to kill him. Will anyone propose any way that we could get him to go to that battle? <laughs> okay. Now, who's he talking to? Ahab. Micah is telling the vision that he saw of the council in heaven to Ahab himself. He's basically saying, Ahab, God has determined to kill you. And he asked for volunteers among the angels. Will anyone help me lure Ahab to battle? Now, if you heard something like that about yourself, would you not repent? Would you not beg for your life? Would you not get on your knees and say, please, God, if that's really the truth, then please forgive me of my sins and spare me. Now listen, this vision's not over. Verse 20, the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this matter, and another said on that matter. Well, they had their own prophecy conference up in heaven. One says, well, we can do this. One says, we can do that. We can do this. I mean, this is weird, isn't it? It doesn't fit. It doesn't seem to make human sense. But this is one of the ways God does things. So he has this conference, and one angel proposes this, one angel proposes that. And finally, someone comes up and says, uh, 22, the Lord said to him, oh, someone says in 21, I'll persuade him. I'll persuade him. And the Lord said to him, wherewith or how? How are you going to persuade him? And he said, I'll go forth and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouths of his prophets. Ever hear of spiritual warfare? We're in it. I'll go and lie to him through these prophets. And uh, that'll do it. And the Lord says, okay, go. And persuade him. And prevail. Do it. Now, <laughs> now think about this with me. The man who is doomed has just been told Something from the word of the Lord, which he knows is the word of the Lord, because he didn't reject the first word the guy gave. He said, come on, tell me the truth. I, I, I put you on the road by God. Please tell me the truth. And then he says, you are going to die. And then to explain the lies, he said, what's been going on is because of a council in the heavens with the Lord and his angels. And a fallen angel came up and said, look, I'll do it, Lord. I'll do it. Even the devil has to serve the Lord. And the Lord said, how are you going to do it? Now, that doesn't make sense either because God knows everything. But this is illustrative. How do you want to do this? Well, I'll just get into the mouth of his prophets and I'll make them all liars. Well, they already are liars. And I'm going to make them liars, right? And so then we will just take out Ahab. Now, once again, 
If that kind of discussion happened in your presence about you, what would you do? I'd be on my face. I'd be begging for forgiveness. I would ask Jesus to come into my heart. I would ask God to save me. I would say, please don't let me do that. But the last thing I do is go on to battle, right? But how hard are people? This is the other lesson from this very terrifying story. What is the capacity for self-deception? What will people go on to do even in the face of undisputed truth? You know, we, we, we should fear this about ourselves. Okay, they received not the, the, the book of 2 Thessalonians. This is New Testament. In the last days, God is going to send a strong delusion and people are going to believe the lies of the Antichrist and then he tells you why. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved and they will be damned, it says. Because they could, they, 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 this capacity we have to tell ourselves everything's all right. It's like the normalcy bias. It's like everything's normal, okay? Remember uh, Baghdad Bob in the war in Iraq, standing there on the news. Buildings blowing up, U.S. tanks going behind him. He goes, we got this under control. The U.S. Army's not anywhere around. And it's like we laughed at him. I saw newscasters standing in Seattle with buildings burning behind them. This is a very peaceful demonstration, and we're all glad that these young idealistic children are doing things as he's dodging bricks. Not just him, but all who nourish themselves on him do not love the truth. They actually love the lie. So let's go on with the story. It even gets weirder. <laughs> So, verse 23, the Lord, thou therefore behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. And the Lord hath spoken evil concerning you, King Ahab. Evil awaits you. And Zedekiah, which, whose name, he's one of the prophets, whose name means the Lord is righteous. So what's he doing? Zedekiah, the son of Shania, went over and smote Micah on the cheek. Yeah, no good deed goes unpunished. How dare you tell the truth? How dare you contradict our positive prophecies? How dare you? He smites him on the cheek and said, which way did the spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? Now look, wisdom cries out in the streets. How many believe that? You can look at current events and what's going on in this world, and I'm telling you, wisdom is crying out. If you have the blessing enough to perceive the deeper meaning of current events. Okay, now, now, let me just take a step back, okay. One of the benefits of the recent events is this. A whole lot of false prophets have been exposed in the church. Now, I absolutely was so happy and am so happy that Trump was president. I love him and I wish he was in there for four more years. Furthermore, I do believe he was stolen from. He was ripped off. And that in itself scares me. It's just so blatant, they're not even trying to hide it anymore. It's just like, like Clinton said one time, why do you do what you do, Bill? I do it because I can, okay. Pure power, they do not worship God, they worship power alone and they are holy, unholy terrors, really. But, um, the, and I also was very hopeful because I, and I'm not ashamed to say this, I thought, well, there's constitutional uh, recourse to take for what's happened. So it was one after another and after another. And I also listened to a lot of people online, and I'm not ashamed of that either, because I don't mind the fact that I don't want to be socialist, and I don't want to raise my grandchildren in a socialistic country, and neither do I want to see this country become Venezuela. I'm not ashamed of that, none whatsoever, okay? But then what happens, and, and, and I'm not even getting into the charismatic prophets, who just flat out said, the Lord has shown me Trump is in for a second term, and this is going to happen, that's going to happen, this is going to happen. And I mean not one or two, but like 50 of them. 
they've, they've, they've proven them some false prophets. Now, following false prophets is a serious, serious problem. Because people need truth. They need it straight. Now, here's what, uh, here's what happened, too. And this is how wisdom was crying out to me. Okay, on January 6th, I thought something was going to happen. And I, I did think something was happening. But, but, and I think it was all legitimate, too. There was a, should have been a legitimate debate and stuff like that. But it didn't happen. And then January 20th, you know, came and went. And, and, the news, and I actually saw people online saying, uh, one guy says, what happened on January 28th was pre-taped. It's not even real. It's all an illusion. I saw it 10 hours before it happened in Spain. And basically, Trump is the real president right now. And he's waiting till March 4th to be uh, inaugurated. And that's when I realized how much trouble some people are in. Is it evil to want Trump? No. Is it evil to hope for a, re, a recourse? No. Like Trump said, I've just used all my, everything at my disposal, but every door shut to him because there's so much corruption and evil. But when you go on and tell yourself, really Trump is president, this is the power of false prophecy. And if you can tell yourself that, what else are you gonna tell yourself? And what are they going to say on March 4th when, uh, I, I, I doubt, that, <laughs> I mean, if it happens, okay, great. This has been a strange time in life, but I, I really don't think that's going to happen. And I, I don't even mind someone saying, well, I hope it happens or it might happen or they can do this or that or the other. But when you say the Lord says, following a false prophet is serious. That's one of the meanings of this. The Lord did not say. It, this rem, what this reminds me of, if you don't mind my getting off on the sideline here, same subject though, is the great disappointment of 1844. Now I know you all know about that, so I'm just going to keep going, all right? Oh, there was a hand that raised in the back. All right, I'll tell you. There's a, <laughs> Bible prophecy was a forgotten subject for a long time. Rightly so. The Bible says the closer you get to the end, then people will understand. But around the 1840s, there were people really getting into Bible prophecy. And one guy made a pronouncement, and he became like an instant celebrity in America. He said, Jesus is going to come back, according to my calculations, in October 1844. And he gave it a certain date, something like that. And it was like it was really weird because they didn't have mass communication and everything but this word spread all over the world and you had people selling their farms you had people uh, bailing out on loans you had people in white pajamas on mountaintops waiting for Christ to come back and I don't know if you noticed or not but he didn't come okay now that hurts right it hurts and it hurts to be wrong but it's also a test of where you're going to go from there. Now, some people just said, skip all of Christianity. I'm through. And unless they change, they're in hell right now. Other people did what fallen human capacity for deception would lead you to do. One group said Christ really did come into the heavenly sanctuary. And that group is called the Seventh-day Adventists. Another group said, well, we've got to get these prophecies right. We're going to go back to the study. The guys think it was right, but he got it wrong. And so they began to make predictions. They're called the Jehovah's Witnesses. Another group had just started right before this. And they were really in the end time Adventist-type prophecy. And they went wholesale. And then they went to their new leader, Joseph Smith, for explanation. Another group was called the Christadelphians. They're not very big here, but they're huge in England and in Australia and in New Zealand. I know a man in Australia whose son got caught up in that cult and he committed suicide because they shunned him. But listen, all because they believed false prophets. And then when it didn't happen, they tried to rationalize it. Anything but saying, you know what, I'm wrong. 
I remember one time my wife and I went to a pastor's conference in Winthrop, Iowa, Word Faith people, and it was back in the early 80s, we were following Copeland, and a car pulled in the parking lot with a bumper, uh, no, it had a vanity license plate that said, I am, the letter I, the letter M, the letter A, and then with a little G, God. And I looked at my wife, and she looked at me, and we go, what in the world have we got ourselves into? And the Holy Spirit did speak to me and said, I know it was him because I couldn't have thought of this in a million years. All he's doing is taking your teachers to their logical conclusion. And, you know, we had a choice to make. Do we love truth? Or are we loyal to some false teacher or some group of people, word faith. Man, we, we had to re-examine everything we believed. We went right back to square one in the light of scripture. That's what we had to do. You got to. And we had a church at the time. We had amazing church growth. It went from about 80 to about 20. It was incredible. Okay. But look, there's not a person alive that's not going to be brought to this kind of a test. You love the truth? See, what, what, you know, I, I, I don't blame people for wanting things to happen or other things not to happen. And I don't even blame people for saying, well, that doesn't seem right that a pro-abortion homosexual relic, a bloated corpse from Washington for 48 years is now president. Well, it doesn't seem right, but it wouldn't be the first time the country was ruled by someone evil. Jesus was born under Pontius Pilate and Herod. <laughs> well, of course, of course we know what we think ought to be. But there's a huge, huge picture. So what's Ahab do? Well, of course he, he goes to battle. <laughs> After all that. And so is Jehoshaphat, the dummy. He was real. He was a real Christian. He was a true person, a true man of God. But he was a dummy. Because he sat there and was given insight into the inner workings of the divine council. The Most High stands there with all angels, fallen and unfallen, and calls for volunteers to destroy Ahab. And they both heard it. But they went to battle. Now here's what happened in the battle. There's still more lessons to be gained. I'm going to try and end this, but you've got to admit, it's been a year since I preached, so I've got to get, get in my preaching. <laughs> Um, <laughs> they go to battle, but first, Jehoshaphat notices Ahab's changing his clothes. Hey, what are you doing, Ahab? <laughs> well, I don't want them to know I'm a king, because they're going to go after the kings. This is on the way into battle. Jehoshaphat don't have time to change his clothes. He's going in as a king, but his friend that he believed in, and said, my army is your army, my life is your life, my horses are your life. He just threw him under the bus. Let him go after, let him go after Jehoshaphat. I'm going to disguise myself. Now, there's only one person you can't fool. That's God. Now, the Bible says that the troops of the enemy went right after Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat cried out, loud. I mean, he was so scared. Fled for his life. They were shooting at him and they wanted to kill him. And meanwhile, Ahab is in disguise, <laughs> watching his friend die. Such is the ecumenical movement. What fellowship does light have with darkness? What fellowship does Christ have with Satan? Can you have communion with devils? Of course not. On the way back, when he just barely escaped with his life, a prophet comes running up to Ahab's, or uh, Jeho Jehoshaphat's chariot and says, why do you want to help the wicked? Why do you love those who hate the Lord? Is that not the choice we're facing too? Why do you want to help the wicked? Well, I don't. Why do you love those that hate the Lord? Well, shouldn't we love everyone? Well, in one way we should, but in another way, no, we shouldn't. 
Yes, I would, I would that every single person be saved. I pray to God that they'll be saved. I pray I wouldn't wish hell on anybody. I wouldn't want anyone to go to hell. It's so horrible that I don't even hardly preach about it because I, it, it, it's, it's horrible. I only do it if God really puts it on my heart. I wouldn't want that for Osama bin Laden, right? But on the other hand, there's another sense in which I hate Osama bin Laden and his cause and everything he wanted to do. I hope it all collapses. I hope it all falls. I can't stand uh, Biden and all these people who want to homosexualize this country. I don't want to live in a gay world. I hate them for that reason and in that sense. But in the other sense, I love them. You know why I'm bringing this out? Because part of the confusion is very, very weak views on what love is. And Christians are going to be brought to heal What's the matter with you? Aren't you loving? Shouldn't you go along with the program? What's your problem? Are you a bigot? Are you a homophobe? <laughs> and I hope that we get impervious to that and won't ever let that touch us on any level. Amen. See, many are going to fall because of humanistic love. Anyway, what happened to Ahab? He's out there in disguise, man. Yeah, go after Jehoshaphat. Get him, get him, get him. And just a random archer shoots an arrow at him, and there's only one spot on his armor where there's a gap. And guess where the arrow goes? Right in that place. Why? Because he thought he, he knew about the divine counsel. He knew that God wanted to take him out. He wouldn't repent. He just tried to outsmart him. He knew what was headed. he was headed for. So did that dummy Jehoshaphat. He knew too. That's why a prophet ran out and rebuked him. Hey, why do you love those that are evil? What's your problem? Why do you want to help the people that hate the Lord? Personally, I don't. So, the end of the story is Ahab, the fake, says, prop me up in my chariot. Make it look like I'm still alive so that they'll just keep fighting. See, leftism and atheism and all that stuff, it's dead. It's done. But because of deception, people prop it up and they'll follow it. Where does it lead? Hell. Hell. This is quite a story, isn't it? See, you don't want to unhook yourself from the Old Testament. We want to keep it. There are so many false prophets. Now, I could go into detail here. I, I won't. I've kept you too long. But I mean, the prophet after prophet after prophet, thus saith the Lord. Pat Robertson, Chris Volaton, uh, a guy named Jeremiah Johnson. I mean, I, I wrote a book about false prophets. And that was a long time ago. And I haven't even kept up very well on them. I don't even know the new ones. But it's all the same rhetoric. Thus saith the Lord, go for it, go for it, you can do it. You know, the, you know, in closing, can I say a thing about false prophets? The very essence of what a false prophet is, according to Jeremiah. If you want a good book on false prophets, Jeremiah. If you want a good chapter on it, Jeremiah 23. And in Jeremiah 23, he says, look, the very essence of a false prophet is that in the name of God, they will tell people, who have no fear of God whatsoever. That everything's cool. Everything's all right. God is love. <laughs> I kid you not. They don't fear God. They don't love God. They have no motion toward God. But you know what? A false prophet will come. I'll give you a great example of one. It's Charles Stanley. Terrible false prophet. Terrible man of Satan. Why do I say that? He wrote a book called um, Once Saved, Always Saved. That the title itself is, is, is a deception. And in the book he said, look, if you've ever sincerely prayed the sinner's prayer, I don't care if you backside and become an atheist and go out and lead thousands of people away from God. Your salvation's secure. If you die that way, you're good. <laughs> That's, he's right out of Jeremiah 23. And in closing, you know, the Bible says that, uh, Jeremiah 5 again, Jeremiah 5, 31. The prophets prophesy falsely, 
See, what, a, what an opportunity to get, get people out from underneath these false prophets. They've all been discredited. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by their means. What that mean? Many people in the ministry for money. But then he says, you know the worst thing? The horrifying thing? My people, they love to have it so. I don't care how wrong these people prove to be. They'll always have a constituency. In fact, if there wasn't a uh, Chris Volaton or a Bill Johnson or a Kenneth Copeland or a Benny Hinn, if there wasn't one, someone would have to invent one. You know why? Because millions of people demand it. You've got to have preachers telling us what we want. We've got to have them, and they will. They'll always be there, believe me, right to the end. But, you know, the prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by their means. What's the next part of it? My people love to have it so. That's the real horror. You know, Ahab, you go through all that and you still go to battle? Oh, yeah, they will. They'll plunge on because they don't receive the love of the truth. Now, many, <laughs> I do believe we're in a time of clarification. Many are being saved right now because it's just so blatantly evil out there that they're like, oh, what in the heck? Even leftists, even liberals, even Muslims. You know, ISIS has created more Christians out of Muslims than any evangelistic effort we could ever make. So has the Islamic Republic of Iran. They've made people into Christians because it just gets so bad. It's so wrong. So blatant. When you talk about blatant, how about a prophet telling you, you know, I just saw a council in heaven and they're talking about killing you. <laughs> Wouldn't that be blatant? And that's where Jeremiah 5.31 ends. Prophets prophesy falsely. Priests bear rule by their means. My people love to have it so. And then he asks a question. What will you do in the end? In other words, where is it going to take you? I wrote the, it was that book like 20 years ago. Revised it about five years ago. And, <laughs> you know, people just, <laughs> they just pour in. It doesn't faze them because they don't love the truth. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, thank you that you are a God that speaks. And I pray that you'd speak to each individual heart, to all of us. I pray that we would be more like the prophet Micaiah than the 400 prophets doing evil. I pray that we love people enough to, in love, tell the truth. I pray, O oh Lord God, that you would bless the five loaves and two fish of this little tiny church and multiply the teachings, the books, the sermons, the writings, so that we could feed many the bread of life. In Jesus' name. Amen.